All right, good morning. This is Sunday School, Acts chapter 13 and part number 8, please. Acts chapter 13, if your Bibles, go ahead and turn that. That's where we're going to begin. We've been going through and reading about the exhortation that Paul is giving to those in the synagogue in Antioch. We're going to pick back up there, uh, going over with specificity all of the accounts that he uh, recounts here. So he goes through different areas of the scripture and covers various areas, as we said, in a systematic and uh, methodical way. He doesn't just pick them willy-nilly. He has a reason for what he does, because the ultimate proof that he is trying to uh, reach is that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. He is who he says he is. I don't know if you guys have seen the video that's making its rounds on Facebook. There is a man from uh, Chicago. He's a news anchor, and he has been diagnosed with a terminal brain cancer. Anybody see that video posted on there? And so it was just posted yesterday, and uh, it's making its rounds. It's all over the place. And they kind of go to the side and they say, we have a special announcement. We would like to uh, uh, go over to this side here and discuss uh, some things that are happening in the life of you know, XYZ, this guy who is the, the news anchor. And, and while they're sitting there, the lady says, uh, go ahead and you know, tell us what's going on. Well, I'd just like to let you know, you know I've had a, a lot of uh, health issues as of the last couple months, and they've determined that I have an inoperable brain tumor. The guy's like 40 years old, and uh, I'll be dead in the next four to six months, right? And so he says, well, as you may know, I'm a born-again Christian, right? And then he goes on to give just a couple little things. He just says, and I, I know that um, I will, it'll be okay, right? Very, very generic, you know? And I always think about what, what I would do in a situation like that, right? So you get into a position in which, okay, you got an inoperable brain tumor, you got four to six months, how much would your life really change, right? Would it change? Should it change? right in reality it really shouldn't change at all right you should be doing the exact same things that you're doing but what does everybody do the second they have an inoperable brain tumor i'm a born again christian everybody needs to become a christian everybody needs to get saved everybody needs to believe jesus christ died on the cross for their sins why is it that all of a sudden that that becomes the motivation right it's because you can buy into the lie of the world that you know oh i got plenty of time right i got plenty of time and the more time i have you know and i'll, I'll be good so in that, in that article, it was very, you know, people were always praising him for what he said, but I said, you know, really, he was very generic in what he said. Sure, he said he was a born-again Christian, but, I mean, he never said, you know, look, this is a temporal, earthly body, right? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I mean, think about the power if he would have said something like that, right? But it's what I call the political correctness of Christianity, which is impossible, right? Christianity is not politically correct. The Bible is not politically correct, right? It, it doesn't work. It's, it's offensive, and it's going to be so. So, you know, if he started saying inherent in the, in the gospel is the condemnation of mankind, right? Yeah, it's there. So you can't really get around it, and I think he could have used that opportunity to do, to do some other things, but, you know, would you, just think about that. Would your life change, and how much would it change, and what things would you be doing, right? And then why would, you, why would your life magically change, right? Well, the reason why, if you're a believer, is all of a sudden, you now go, oh, wow, I'm going to be in the presence of God quicker. Um, I better have some things uh, to, to talk about, right? I mean, as Paul says in the book of Colossians, he, 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 he writes this so, so perfectly. If you look at, just you can look at this for a second or I can read it to you, but in the book of Colossians, chapter number uh, 1, in verse number 28, he says, whom we preach, this is Jesus Christ, he says, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, right? So that presentation aspect of, of your work, your work of the ministry, people are your work of the ministry. It's not just your actual work, it's people as well. It's the, it's the eternal souls of men who are part of the judgment seat of Christ, most definitely, right? So what was the doctrine that you taught that person and, 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 and did that doctrine stick and was it good doctrine, right? So that's kind of what Paul is also doing here in Acts chapter number 13. It's a reversal, a reversal of the way of thinking. It's, it's a reversal. Look, guys, okay, here's the deal, all right? For so long, you've been doing things incorrectly. I've proven it to you. For so long, you've, you've rejected the kings. You've rejected God. You've rejected the judges. Now, will you reject me too? You already rejected the Christ, the one and only. 
So he's putting them that that issue here is like this is the only way. It's Jesus Christ or none. So in this exhortation in this synagogue at Antioch, what it should be doing, should is what you know what you want to occur, doesn't necessarily mean what is happening, but what should be happening is there should be striking in the hearts of the Israelites listening to Paul's exhortation, conviction, right? Conviction concerning the rejection of Jesus. Conviction to their blindness about the scriptures. The promise to David concerning an eternal kingdom means that one who is eternal must sit on that throne. At the death of David, it's obvious to David, it's not going to be me, that's eternal. There must be one who is eternal to sit. The prophet Nathan told David that it was going to be his seed after him that would set up his kingdom and that God would establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Did Israel know about that promise? Were they aware of this eternal kingdom that was to come? Yeah, obviously. We're going to look at some verses today in which the people of Israel, we're going to look at this distinction as, as, as both Mark and Matthew writes, the common people, they knew about this. They heard about this. They, they were aware of this upcoming kingdom. I mean, it's to some, they may have thought it was a fairy tale because it's been so long. It's taken so long to come. And the longer it takes, what happens? The less faith you have that it's actually going to occur, right? I mean, it's why people today say, where is Jesus? Where is this kingdom? Well, i got plenty to talk about that. I can tell you exactly where it is. But when you don't know, what do you do? Your faith is shaken. You go, I don't really know. And you just, you have this blind faith. So there's no necessity for anybody to have blind faith, right? Meaning that, oh, it's in there somewhere. I just believe it. It's in the scripture somewhere. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, and you need to have that Word of God to produce that faith because you believe the Word of God because of the trustworthiness of it. And so what Paul is doing is, is he is preaching to them the Word of God. He's giving them the information that they need to have faith in Jesus Christ. The nation of Israel, they knew about this promise to David. This, this promise that upon the, the death of David, that they were to continually look for one to come who would be this eternal redeemer, protector, deliverer, ruler, judge, and king. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. I, I'm, we're going to look through a ton of scriptures today. So let's look at the prophecy of Nathan to David regarding this kingdom in 2 Samuel chapter number 7. Okay? So Acts 13, of course, what we're going over, I'll just, I'll read it for a second. All it says, it says, and when he removed him, that's removing Saul. We talked about him last week. What did Saul do? Saul was disobedient. He did not hearken unto the voice of the Lord. And what did God do? I reject him from rolling. I'm going to remove him, as it says here. And when he removed him, and remember, he, he, he was rejected because of his what? His partial obedience, which to God was that total disobedience. He says, he raised them up to David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So look at 2 Samuel chapter number 7, please. 1 and 2 Samuel chapter number 7. And let's, and let's read this, okay? 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse number 4. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan. So let's talk about that for just one second. Notice how it didn't say they delivered to him a version of the King James Bible and it had 2 Samuel in it and then he read it. See, what they were doing is they were relying upon the words of God coming from the words of men, meaning from the mouths of men. And it says, and it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan. And how did he confirm a lot of this stuff? He confirmed a lot of this stuff because it came true after the fact, but he confirmed a lot of what he says with the signs and the wonders, right? Same thing from that beginning of the Exodus in Egypt, the way that God confirmed. The Moses, again, Moses says to God, how are we, how, the, the Israelites are going to look at me and just laugh and say, you're an idiot, we're not going to believe you, we're not following you, what am I going to do to prove to them? And we see that from their inception, they did what? They required those signs, and God produced them and gave them. Read in verse number 4, it says, And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day. 
but I have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build me not a, a house of cedar? Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat. From the following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. The, the corollaries and the similarities between David and Jesus Christ could be preached for 10 sermons, 20 sermons, I mean millions of sermons. I mean, we could go forever to discuss this. But this little, this little sheep coat guy, this little guy who's ruling over the sheep, they set him to be the ruler over the people. It's the guy who, who is on the low on the totem pole, the one whose outward appearance looks like he would never be a king to be the one who is a king. And he says, And I was with thee whensoever thou wentest, and I have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You're starting to see the eternal nature of this kingdom. And the only way that you're going to have an eternal nature of a kingdom is if you have an eternal king. And if all have sinned, and the reason why mankind sins, or the reason why mankind dies is because of sin, there must be one to come who has no sin. See, the, the logical conclusions that I'm making could be made by these men at that time as well, and are made. We're going to look at some issues here in just a second with, with Jeremiah. There is just finish a couple more things. He says, And I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him. And these are what we're going to get into in just a second with these sure mercies of David. What David gets is a picture of mercy. He says, As I did, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever, according to all these words and according to all this vision. So did Nathan speak unto David. There's a good, I don't even know, 30 something odd kings after David, okay? There's a ton of kings. And what does each one of those prove? This ain't the guy, this ain't the guy, this ain't the dude, this ain't the one, this one is horrible. And what are they hopefully getting to a point of going to? Um, God, where is, this, where is this one at? Where is this one that's, that's going to that's gonna do it correctly as we're going to read in Jeremiah? There's much prophecy regarding this, the need for this seed of David to be, to be righteous. The need for it to be just and to bring judgment and bring justice and, to, and to, to get rid of the unrighteous, ungodly leaders and the unrighteous rulers of Israel. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 23. In Jeremiah 23, what we see is Jeremiah's woes to those leaders and that they need to take this seriously, these leaders, this woe, because there's one who's coming who's going to set the record straight. And if you read in Jeremiah 23 and verse number 1, it says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Now, if you think about what Jesus Christ came to do, he came to do what? He came to gather. 
I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So when you think about that phrase, which we, we probably say that verse, I don't think we can get around on a Sunday without talking about that verse, because it's so, it's so critical to an understanding of what's taking place. These lost sheep are lost because the pastors have scattered the flock. And how do they scatter the flock? Smite the shepherds, scatter the flock. It's basically what takes place is it's a judgment issue, right? When they're walking the statutes, the ordinance, and the judgments, what happens? God protects them. God's there to deliver them. When they don't, what happens? I mean, they just go all over the place. They're turned, everyone to his own way, right? Every, whatever they want to go do, they go and do. Isaiah 53. Verse 2 of Jeremiah 23, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people, Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Think about this. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath of come, wrath to come? Right? Can you see how these verses kind of just work together? Yeah. He says, And I will gather the remnant of my flock, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? Fear not, little flock. For it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He says, and I will gather the remnant of the, my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them. Well, notice again how it works here. See, see, how, it says, see how it says up here, he says, ye have scattered my flock. And he says, and I will gather the remnant of my a flock out of all the countries, whither I have driven them. See, if we go all the way back to the, to the book of Deuteronomy, and you can see what, they, what he tells them about what takes place when they're disobedient. When they're disobedient, what happens? They're scattered. They don't get to possess that land without their enemies bothering them, as it talks about, as we just read there in 2 Samuel. They're not all there possessing that land that, of Canaan and all the area from the Euphrates all the way over. No. Because of their disobedience. And because they have put to themselves leaders. No. They are responsible for the leadership that they put in place. Why? Because we just saw in the very beginning there with Samuel, what did they request? Give us a king. We want a king. Why? Because everybody else has one, and we want one too. But look, they're going to be really unrighteous and unjust and do things incorrectly. You sure you still want one? Yes. It's going to be a really bad idea. You sure you still want one? Well, of course we do. See, Israel is so, they're so arrogantly ignorant and so stubborn. And we use them as a, we use them as a, as a teaching point. And really, it's a, it's, a, it's a learning tool for us to go back and look and go, just as Christ says, don't be like your fathers. Shouldn't you learn? I was just talking with my, uh, with my friend the other day, and I said, this was, actually, it was yesterday. We were sitting in his backyard. He's got a little one-and-a-half-year-old, and he's got another one on the way. And I said, you know, do you think about your life like this with your kid? Like, you think about all the mistakes your parents made, right? I mean, they're, they're there. You know, you know about them now as you get older, right? You didn't really, maybe when you were growing up, you didn't realize that they, there were certain things that they raised you on that weren't correct. And don't you think to yourself, okay, I'm going to fix those things, right? Those are the things that I'm going to fix. I'm going to, I'm going to do those better. And he's like, yeah, it's funny. I was just thinking about that. I was thinking about what can I do to, to create a better environment for my child that my parents didn't give me. Now, his parents were divorced, divorced early on, and he was like, that's the things that I want to, you know, I don't want to get divorced. It's part of the reason why he, he moved back from Texas because he, he said, you know, over there, there was, he was working in a really high-paying job and some issues, and he's like, man, it, it was going to be really easy for me to go by the wayside, you know, and just be gone from my wife way too long, way too much socializing, partying, uh, entertaining these different uh, clients that they had. And he says, I had to get out of that. I had to get out of it fast. And it was good. He saw that. And he can see, like, I don't, I want to, he wants to give his kid. And that's what I was saying, too. I want to give my child, you know, everything that my parents couldn't give me. And I think that's just natural. And as it progresses, you should, hopefully, everybody should come full circle with that. But there is a there is a responsibility to to do that, right? There's a responsibility that you can just ignore it and neglect it and not learn from what your parents did. And what will happen? You'll just repeat the mistakes. If you don't remember that history, you're you're doomed to repeat it. When you read in verse number four, he says, And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. See, meaning meaning these are the shepherds that are going to feed them correctly. Do you remember what Christ tells Peter three times? At the very right after the resurrection, he says, Peter, do you love me? And he goes, yeah. He goes, feed my sheep. And he goes, okay. And he asks him again, Peter, do, do you love me? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I already told you I love you. And he says, 
feed my flock, right? So this is this issue of, of we need guys. We need, we need this small group of people. It's not going to be the leaders. not going to be the elders. not going to be the scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests. They're not going to do the job. We already know what's going to come upon them, right? You generation of vipers. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? When you read here, he says, And I'll set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Now notice this next verse. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. It's not any clearer than that, right? This is the one and only. Once you have a king that's called the Lord our righteousness, do you need any other kings? No, I think we got this one taken care of. I think we got a guy who's going to do it correctly. The Lord our righteousness. You know, this passage helps demonstrates why Jesus Christ was again sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and how they were in fact lost. It also helps show the parallels between David and Christ in that sheep tending aspect. David tended literal sheep, and Jesus tended to the sheep, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. David sent on, sat on a temporal, earthly throne. Jesus will sit on that heavenly, eternal throne. And this is what Jesus Christ does so much in his doctrinal teaching. It's that shifting. It's that focus shift. Hey, stop thinking carnal. Stop thinking carnal. Stop thinking carnal. I mean, how many times do you th- say things like, I am the vine and you are the branches? People are like, what? You're the vine and the branches? Dude, you're a human. You're not a tree, right? I am the bread of life, right? Is this saying hard? Right? Remember when he talks about eating the flesh and the blood? And they're like looking at him like, well, what are you talking about? See, the Catholics still think he's, they, that's, the Catholics are incorrect. They still think what? They're still thinking, yeah, he's eating the literal physical blood. And he's like, I already told you it's not what I'm talking about. You know? Is this a hard say? You going to take a bite out of my arm right now? You want to drain my blood? He changes the minds. It's a shifting from the focus away from the carnal aspects onto the spiritual aspects of things. And he uses... He uses physical things to talk about life lessons. He talks to the woman at the well, right? What does he talk about? Being the water. How is he water? What do you mean water, right? It's the things of life and how he is life. So if you go over here in, uh, in Acts chapter 13 for a second, as I stated, there are those who are looking for the Redeemer to come. Lots, okay? There's lots of people who know about the prophecies of David, who know about a coming redeemer, who know about a king. Okay? They've had, they have, I think they have 40 kings in Israel. It's a lot of kings. It's a lot of people. And, and out of those 40, who's the most famous? You know, David, by far. And what's going to come from David? There's going to be that, that one, that righteous branch. In Acts chapter 13, and verse number 23, it says, Of this man's seed... That's of David's seed. Hath God, according to his promise, that's the validification, the verification of what God says. Hey, God promised it. He made it happen. And he raised up unto Israel a Savior. And how is this Savior envisioned? It's not just a Savior. He's going to save his people from their sins. Well, yeah, that's one part of it. He's going to save them from themselves, from their leadership, from the, the pastors who have ruled their flock incorrectly. He's going to save them from the, the hands of all them that hate them, right? Read, read Luke chapter number 1 and 2 where that prophet, prophecy to, to Zacharias. But they're looking for that Redeemer to come. And he says here, when John had first preached, what I like about this is, so what Paul does is he's like, see, I'm not going to let you just get away and go like, oh, we still hate John the Baptist. No, no, no. John was right, right? That's what he's really doing. He's saying, I'm going to go right to John the Baptist and say, when John had first preached, before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. What did he preach? That they are to believe on him who is to come. And Paul clarifies that to those at Ephesians, that is on Christ Jesus. I mean, that, that's, that's the issue. Do you believe? Remember when, when uh, Jesus talks with uh, you know, Mary and Martha, uh, with, with Lazarus, and he says, to, he says, you know, I am the resurrection and life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And what's the response of Martha? She says, yea, I believe that thou art what? Thou art the Christ. She believes that he's the, he's the king. And what does that really mean? What's that all about? That's about this, this prophetic element that's been promised, this, this throne aspect, but this really this redeemer and this savior. 
this guy who's going to come. And, and they know about it so much so that, keep reading, he says this, uh, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? What do they all say? Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Is this, is this, is this Elias? Who is, who is this? Is this that guy? Which guy is this? Is this the one that's supposed to come? They're confused, but they kind of know. You know, it's still in there. It's still in their teaching that, that there is a guy who's going to come. He says, Whom, Who think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me. We saw him come. His name was Jesus Christ. Whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to lose. Paul validates the message of John the Baptist to the people and makes it clear that he was sent to prophesy the one who is to come. The book of Matthew starts off by saying, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Wow, that's, that's pretty, pretty important, huh? He didn't say, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, who was and is and will always be, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of the end, God incarnate in the flesh. No, what's the purpose of that? I mean, all those are true statements. But the purpose of that book is to show right there as he says. He says, look what he says again. I, I, Matthew 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And then he says, the son of Abraham. What's he trying to prove? Hey, remember all those things that God told Abraham? Yeah, those came true. Remember all that stuff he told David? Yeah, that stuff came true. And why is it that they will not believe? Well, the rejection of Jesus was, was not completely throughout Israel. You've heard of trickle-down economics, I'm sure, right? You raise the taxes on the wealthy, what are they going to do? Just pass it on as cost to the consumers. It doesn't work, right? Oh, I'll just raise taxes. Okay, well, great. And I'll just raise my prices, you know, and it's just going to hurt everybody else. So this is the same thing with the trickle-down effect of the leadership. When you put bad leadership and authority, what do you have? What do you expect? What goes in? must come out. And as you read and go through the scriptures, you see this trickle-down effect, meaning that the leadership that is corrupt, corrupts the people. As the leaders speak against Jesus as the Christ, the people do what? The people follow suit. Because some, some of them are going, oh, this is he. Wow, this is the Christ. We're going to look at some verses. And then as times go on, they finally eventually go, ah, crucify him. Kill him. Let's look at some key passages in the, in the people's connecting of the dots and how they relate here in Acts chapter 13 regarding who Jesus was as the seed of David. And let's compare the response that the leaders get who can't seem to get it through their head who Jesus really is. Meaning, they're just so blinded, they just don't want to see it. Because, in, in, and I think, I think Caiaphas says it best, he's going to take away our nation and he's going to take away our place. Yeah, he is. I have no need for you. When you have a righteous judge, I don't need any unrighteous judges in there. I don't need any unrighteous people ruling over the people incorrectly, laying grievous burdens, <laughs> sitting out there making a show in the flesh. Matthew chapter number 12 is a great passage in which he says this. Look at this. Matthew chapter 12, in verse number 22, it says, then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw, and all the people were amazed and said, look at this, is not this the son of David? What are they looking for? So they're not really looking for Jesus Christ, the son of God. They're looking for Jesus Christ, the son of who? Jesus Christ, the son of David. But look what the Pharisees do. Look at this response. The people's response, is this not the son of David? The leaders, the Pharisees, this man is a devil. Well, he reads. But when the Pharisees heard of it, they said, they, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. See, they don't see it. They do, but they don't. Do they understand who the son of David is? Of course they do, right? Of course they do. And if he were to come... And he would say, oh, I thank God that I'm not like these little common folks. Look at me and everything I do, right? Don't you think that, don't you think that they, the Pharisees would have accepted him in a second and said, yeah, this is the guy we want. But when Christ comes and looks at him and says, dude, you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You're full of dead man's bones. Wow. Wow. And that's some bold statements. He does that right there in the next, in the next passage in, in Matthew 23. 
But, but what this is, is the trickle-down effect. Look at Matthew 21, verse number 9. I mean, this is this is moments before his this is moments before his crucifixion. You know, not too long after you get them saying here in verse number nine. Actually, look at verse number eight of chapter twenty-one. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches in the trees and and strawed them in the way. And and the multitudes that went before and followed cried, saying, "Hosanna to the who? To the son of David, right?" Hosanna to the son of David. This was a big deal for them. They knew what this meant. If you said to a Gentile, hey, dude, you know who David is? Yeah, we think we heard about him maybe once or twice. Uh, we're not, not super familiar, right? They didn't have those same promises. It wouldn't make as much sense to them, right? Because it's to them that word of promise was given. But see, what Paul does in Acts chapter 13 is he says, hey, look, this isn't just good for you. It's good for all that fear God. And guess what? You guys, every single one of you, let it be known that through this man is preached the forgiveness of sins. Don't you think the Gentiles are going, well, I got sin? <laughs> yeah. And when they see the Jews reject it, we see the Gentiles in Acts chapter 13 going, hey, preach to this, preach this word to us again. We want to hear it again. What are the Jews saying? Contradicting and blaspheming. No, don't preach that word. It's not what we want to hear. Mark 11:10 it's a parallel verse to Matthew 21 he says blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord You see how this is all coming together The response of the leaders and how Jesus handles their unbelief is 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 amazing He shows great reservation If you look at Matthew chapter 22 in verse number 42 look at this one 41 42 Matthew 22 41 while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Who, who, whose son is he? Now notice this. They don't say, We have no clue who the Christ is. Nor do they say, What? Um, the Christ? Oh yeah, he's the son of God. No, look what he says. Saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And with their own mouths, they admit that they know who he is. When he's the son of David, what does that make him? Royalty makes him a king. They say unto him, the son of David. Now look at verse number 43. He saith unto them, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? You know what he's doing? He's showing them, dude, I'm God. I'm the Lord. I'm the one who made David. I'm the one who put him there. Yeah, I was made a little lower than the angels. I'm here on earth right now. I gave up my glorification, but I didn't lose who I am. And this is so crazy because what they say in verse number 46, look at verse 46. And no man was able to answer him a word. They couldn't go, good luck. What are you going to say to that one? That one even blows my mind. I read that one. I'm like, that's some good logic right there. Well, if, uh, if David then called Lord, how was he his son? He was Lord his son. He was born before. Yeah, because you remember, your father Abraham rejoiced in my day. And he was glad. How say ye that, you remember that whole passage? How say ye that, you know, Abraham rejoiced, what are you, but 40 years old, or whatever they tell him. He's like, dude, eh, you guys are missing this thing. <coughs> I look at the end of 46, it says, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Well, yeah, I wouldn't ask him any more questions either, because I don't want to look like an idiot. Because every time I, we're going to ask questions like this, now we're really getting schooled, right? If you look at Mark chapter number 12, these verses are just so good because they're, they're helpful to show us you know, who Paul's dealing with here. And, 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 and the trickle-down effect, right? These are the guys who they've been having this effect on. Mark chapter 12 and verse number 38. This is, the same, this is the same passage. Look what he says, right? 
Verse 35, And Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord. And whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him, what? Gladly. Notice that the common people get it. The common people are like, yeah, sweet, this is awesome. They're, they heard him gladly. They received that word. They figured it out. They're like, oh, yeah, we get it. And then what do the other guys do? They, they, as we saw in another passage, they, they didn't answer more. They couldn't even say anything. But if you notice in verse 38, here is that full, complete picture of what happens in that, in that meeting. He says, and he said to them in his doctrine, beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief priests in the synagogues and the upper roast rooms at the feast, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, these shall receive greater damnation. He's firm. He's resolute on that. He doesn't waver. Just like John the Baptist tells those guys, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? See, Paul's goal here in Acts chapter 13 is, is very much a confirmation of what has already occurred. He is clarifying that the prophets were right. The judges were right. John the Baptist was right. Jesus was right. He is who he says he was. He's not messing around. Jesus is the son of David. He's the son of the fulfillment of the throne of the king. And there's no getting around that. See, Paul explains how the rejection of Christ occurred. And it has and is and always will be a rejection of the word of God. That is how you reject Jesus Christ. You reject the word of God. If you look at Acts 13 and verse number 27. Note, when you reject the word of God, who do you reject? You reject Jesus Christ. The word was made flesh, dwelt among us. He is the word. Acts chapter 13 and verse number 27, look what it says, look at 26. He says, Men and brethren and children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is this word of this salvation sent. Verse 27, For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not. Now we're going to find out how they not know him. Nor yet the voices of the prophets. Now, did that mean they didn't hear God? They heard God. Did it mean that they didn't listen to the prophets? Well, they listened with their ears. But what does Christ always say? If you, if you see with your eyes and hear with your ears, and what can you do? You can start to understand, right? Why does he say, seeing they see not? How is that possible? And hearing they hear not. How, how does that work? How do you hear and not hear? I mean, the Pharisees are probably like, I hear, I have not fear. Oh, no, I they can't figure it out. But the common people are going like, well, yeah, I mean, you're listening, but you ain't listening. You're not hearing what's really being said. The underlying spiritual aspect of his message, of his doctrine. They didn't listen to the voice of the prophets, which are what? Notice this. This is what's so great about it. They condemned themselves by reading the prophets every day. Right? Oh, think not. Think not to say that if we were in the, in the days of the prophets, we wouldn't have done this. Right? Matthew 23 for a second. Look at this. Matthew 23. Verse number 30. Look at 29. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of her fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify. And some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel and the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together? Even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not.
They read the prophets which specifically state that Israel would condemn Christ and they went through and fulfilled this to the T. They continually rejected the word of God from the men of God as we saw with Samuel. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me for reigning over them. We saw it with the judges. We saw it with Jeremiah. We saw it with John the Baptist. We saw it with the apostles. We saw it with Jesus in the flesh. Remember, it's called that reading with understanding. The most pointed scripture I can find on this point is John chapter 5 and John chapter 8. In John chapter number 5 and verse number 38, look what it writes here. 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Again, think about what he's talking about here. <laughs> Nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day. I mean, they're reading the scripture in the Sabbath day. They just did that here in Acts chapter number 13. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the ruler of the synagogue, this is 13 verse 15, sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation to the people, say on. They, 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 they're reading the scripture. But they're not reading the scripture. Just like today, you can go and sit, and I encourage you to go do this. I think people think that I just get up here and say things about denominationalism because I don't like it. Well, yeah, I don't like it. I think that's very clear. I don't like it because I think it's of the devil. But besides that, if you've never experienced it, this isn't one of those things like, well, how do you know crack cocaine's bad unless you do it? Well, I can watch the effects of everybody else, right? And so if you're really struggling, you really think that denominationalism might be good, well, go have at it. Go see what it's like. And I hope you'll come back really quickly and go, wow, that was pretty messed up. It's pretty messed up. Todd just sent me a, an Instagram the other day of uh, Randy White. Has Randy White on Instagram. Two bottles of wine, his you know, chest is all tattooed or something, saying, like, you got to ask me about something else, blah, 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 blah. And then on the next thing down, it has a picture of Joan Rivers and Robin Williams in heaven saying, I'm sure they're making God laugh, right? I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, dude, don't you guys see this? I mean, this is, this is like the pastors who have no idea. They're not, they shouldn't even be called pastors. They should be called serpents. But if you say that, oh, who are you to say that? He that is spiritual judgeth all things, right? It's a discernment process about what these guys are doing. Look at that ministry. I mean, come on. Raining Paula White, dude? That guy's making bucks over bucks. Tons and tons of money. That's the purpose. Todd commented on the things, must not be given to filthy lucre. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's going to be good. We'll see if he replies back. I don't think he did, but still pretty, still pretty funny. But these guys, they read those scriptures, and he tells them to search those scriptures. So notice he doesn't say, oh, I'm sorry, I made it really complicated. I, I know I didn't give you a scripture, so you can't really look at it. No, he tells them to search the scriptures. Notice that. You know, some people today go, well, the Bible's just so complicated. Okay. How many hours have you spent looking at watching Walking Dead? Right? 30, 40, 60. How many seasons of Breaking Bad have you watched? Oh, all of them? Wow, that's like 60 hours. Now let me ask you. Can you know, you know everything about that show? Oh, I'm a diehard fan. Great. Now, how much time have you spent legitimately studying the scriptures? Not just getting our daily bread and opening it up and getting John 3.16 out of it. I'm saying legitimately studied it. Tried to understand it. Five minutes every six months? Well, yeah. No wonder you don't understand it. Do I sound sarcastic? Yeah, because I was there and I sat there and did I don't know what I'm talking about. I could make up verses. I knew like 2,000 verses by the time I was in like 10th grade because of Awana. I had to put all the dots together later on, but that's, that's just how things go. I mean, this stuff in Samuel and stuff, I mean, I didn't have to spend much time reading that, which was nice, because I already remember a lot of that from growing up. My parents did a good job at instilling that in me, and it wasn't until later. Now I fully appreciate it. I go, okay, yeah, I get it. Didn't really understand anything about Samuel beforehand, but now I get it a lot better. And I, get the, I understand the stories, the accounts all come back to me with Nathan, with Saul, and you know, all that stuff just comes back. And I spend a lot less time reading it, which is, which is helpful. But again, when he says to them, search the scriptures, he's telling them to search the scriptures. 
clearly he's telling them to search something that they possess, that they have in their hand. So is it not reasonable and rational for us to say that we have scriptures if they have scriptures in the time of, you know, again, a lot of perversion? Most of the Mormon church? No. They're going to tell you, oh, we don't have the scriptures. They didn't have them until Joseph Smith got the new time, whatever, you know. People are gonna people are gonna hear what they're gonna want what are gonna want to hear, right? But at, at the end of the day, this is what it comes down to: you have an obligation to God. You do, as a believer. You know, should I read my scripture more? The answer to that question is yes, right? I mean, does anybody say no? You know, look, I read my scriptures uh, four hours every day. Well, you know, there's not like a number. You know, it's not like oh, I read it four hours and I need to read it three hours. Sometimes I might look at the scripture for eight minutes. And you know what? After eight minutes, the rest of the day, all I can do is try to figure out that passage. I'm like thinking about it. I'm like, and my wife comes around the corner in the bathroom and she goes, and I'm in the shower. She's like, what are you talking about in there? Preaching? I'm like, just talking about stuff, you know? I mean, I do that constantly. I'm always like thinking about stuff. And sure, I get distracted with fishing and everything else I do, but I come back and, and go to the realization of, okay, how is this going to benefit me in my life? And then how can I go tell other people about it? I mean, I, I, I think you understand that I'm relatively passionate about discussing the Word of God with people, right? I mean, that's part of what drew me in here was, was Frank's passion about it and then Russ's passion about it, you know? And I, I was like, wow, these people actually, these people actually care about it. They, they want to, they want to, nobody's going to, I'm not going to, you know, nobody's going to be here like, oh man, Frank and Russ, those are like the most perfect people in the entire world. Yeah, nobody's saying that, okay? That's, that's not what I'm looking at. And I remember Russ early on has told me the same thing that everybody else always says, don't put your confidence in men, I'll fail you every time. Good. We understand that. And that's what I do. I, I, I've seen it happen a million times. So I just step back and go, all right, I'll put the confidence in, in the scripture, use it as my as the guide, let the Holy Spirit instruct as need be, and then, you know, be discerning in all things, and then really discuss the word of God with other people in an intelligent manner, right? It seems like that if you want to talk about the scripture, it's not intelligent. It's, it's, uh, it's illogical. It's, well, then maybe you haven't had a discussion with me yet, because I'll, we'll gladly sit down. We're going to start with the gospel. Right? We're going to start with your condemnation before you want to discuss some apparent contradictions that you found in the skeptic's Bible or something stupid. You know, I mean, okay, great, yeah, you know, awesome. You know, either way, they, they believe in books too, right? Oh, really? You, you were there in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue? You saw that happen? No, that's because you read it in a book and somebody told you. Anyways. He says here, and ye will not come to me. Notice this, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. You will not. They, they, they choose to reject who Jesus Christ is. He says, I receive not honor for men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If, if another shall come in his own name, him ye shall receive. Look at that. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Let's close with one passage in John chapter number 8 and verse number 19. So much more to talk about. but John 8 and verse number 19. Look at this. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. And that's it. They don't even know who God is. So when God shows up in the flesh, it's, not, it's no wonder they don't understand who he is. It's no wonder that his word is so foreign to them. Right? We look at it and we go, Dude, how did you miss this? Right? Don't we look at it and go, how did you miss this? Dudes, how did you miss this? Satan is really good at what he does. It's amazing to me that the YouTube videos that get the highest amount of views are any time we talk about the work of Satan. It's weird. The one that we just did the other day, Blinded by Satan. We got you know, so many views on that thing. Tons of comments. People, that's the ones that people want to know about. Well, Why? Because if you don't know anything about your opposition, how are you going to be able to fight against it, right? You need to know your opposition. You need to understand it really well. It's just like in, in marketing and in business, what do they say? You need to know your competition. And your competition is Satan. That's what he does. And denominationalism is part of it. So, you 
know, I appreciate what we can do here at Suncoast. It's not a, not a massive facility or anything. We don't got the skate park. We talk about this all the time, but I think we do a good work here and we equip the saints to go out and do the work of the ministry outside. What takes place here is a very minimal part of the Christian life. It's a minute portion. Out of the week, if you take, let's say you're up for 16 hours, okay? 16 hours of your day times seven. I'm not going to do the math, but you know what I mean. There's a lot there, a lot of hours. This is two hours of the week out of those, okay? It's a minute portion of what it is. But what this should be for us is an instruction, right? It should be, it should be some reproof and correction if it's necessary. But ultimately, it's for you to have a better understanding, as Paul says, that I may know him, right, and the power of his resurrection so that we can go out be equipped, do the work of the ministry, how we ought to answer every man, and so that we don't go, oh, uh, I don't know anything about the Bible. Uh, call Jason, call Russ, call Frank. No, no, it, it's perfectly capable for every person to be versed in the scriptures and, and read them and study them and be able to have good answers to questions and also to be, as Paul says, to, to, to convince the gainsayers, you know? You just, give them this, you just give them the gospel. That's all we need to give them. Just keep giving them the gospel. That will... That'll strike a chord every time. So we'll close with uh, what the word of prayer will pick up next week, and we will go through uh, how they fulfilled what the prophets had spoke, how we'll go back to what Peter says in Acts chapter 4 about the, the, the heathen and their vain imaginations, and then the, the verse that changes everything, the absolute testifier of the truth of God, in which it says, but God, and that's how he raised up Jesus Christ. And that's what changes everything. You kill Christ. You think, oh, I'm done. We're done with him. We killed him. He's never coming back. Yes. And then everybody's like, dude, he's still alive. He's, he's alive. What is that going to do? Well, you're in trouble now. Because as you saw, I mean, some of those verses about what he says, especially there in John chapter 5 where he says, you know, do, do you not think that I will accuse you to the Father? Yeah, he's going to do that. There is one that accuseth you, and that accusation is Moses. See, Moses will accuse them how? in the way that Moses accuses all men. The condemnation that's underneath the law. Go ahead. Go be righteous underneath the law. We'll see how that works out for you. As Paul says, we'll look at uh, the rest of Acts chapter 13. He's going to hit that really hard. You know, you can be justified by all things. All things. All things. And there's a taste of that with David, right? There's a taste of that. There's that mercies of David that you're going to see and you go, wow, how does that really work? And so the people, they remember about what David got. And they, they, they saw his pardon. And they want that. And they want to see that come back full circle with the rest of the nation. So let's go to prayer. Dear God, we